Hi, this is my controller project for the Atari 5200. So, Atari 5200 it has this sort of famously um, terrible controller that it came with that doesn't auto center and has really mushy fire buttons. Um, I've actually rebuilt this controller with gold parts back to better than original factory standards. Um, so it's as best as it can possibly get. So here is my Atari 5200 controller. Um, it's a PC board mounted to a chunk of hardboard gives me something uh, to hold on to. Um, I designed and built this thing myself. Um, I'm not the first person to do this by far. Other people have built homemade controllers before. In particular, at the time I did this project, there was another video out there by Ben Heck, um, who also built um, an analog Atari 5200 gamepad using a uh, digital potentiometer and a microcontroller. Um, I think his is a little nicer than mine in that it has a case and stuff. Probably a bit easier to grip, a little bit more ergonomic, but I decided to make my own um, using the same sort of technique that he did. Um, so just a, a look at the controller. It has a thumbstick on one side. It has two fire buttons on the other. Um, here's the PC board so you can look at it. It actually has a symmetric layout for the, uh, the joystick and the fire button. So you could put your joystick on either the left or the right or your fire buttons on the left or the right. Um, so I could have built a mirror version of this controller with the thumbstick over here and the buttons over there had I wanted to. So there's a plug on the back where you'll plug in a joystick extension cable. It's just a DB15 extension cable. Just plug it into the back and plug this into your Atari 5200. Um, you can actually get these uh, cables from a store online um, for about eight bucks. Um, just make for kind of an ungainly long plug coming out the back if you wanted to. Um, I could have just cut this off, soldered the wires in directly. Um, cable's a little bit easier to work for, especially with the uh, prototype. It's got the numeric keypad, so it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. Um, there's a start button, reset button, and a pause button. So here is the schematic for the controller. Uh, it may look complicated, it's really not. Now let's start with the easiest part, which is the keypad. So the keypad is a typical matrix keypad. There's four rows, four columns. Those wire directly up to the 15-pin uh, joystick connector. Um, each switch bridges um, a row and a column. So like the, uh, does it look like the three switches here? It bridges um, this row with that column. Um, that's straight out of the Atari 5200 schematic. Easy to duplicate that using modern uh, tactile switches. So the interesting part of this circuit is in the potentiometers. You can see I've got a couple footprints for those on here. Um, a left and right. Um, they're on the circuit board. There's a left and a right. Um, that's just so you can put it on either side. Only use one footprint. Don't populate both joysticks. It wouldn't work. Um, so the joystick I chose to use is this one here, known as the Spark Fun joystick or SparkFun thumbstick. Uh, you can get it from SparkFun for about four bucks. Uh, you can also get it from DigiKey for about four bucks. Um, it's a nice self-centering spring-loaded um, thumbstick. Uh, it's also got a switch. If you push down it clicks a switch. Um, two potentiometers, an X potentiometer and a Y potentiometer. Um, it's just a great readily available cheap part. Um, the problem is our 5200 controller has a 500k pot. Um, the SparkFun thumbstick is only available with a 10k pot. That's a difference of 50. Uh, now the way the Atari is going to read um, this joystick is by charging a capacitor. Um, the potentiometer is going to vary in resistance. Um, the amount of time to charge the capacitor is going to vary um, with the position on the potentiometer. So uh, 500k resistor charge very slowly, um, zero resistance charge very quickly. And the 5200, it can uh, read that amount of time um, and then it will know the position on your joystick. So certainly if you went from a 500k potentiometer to a 10k potentiometer, it's gonna totally screw that measurement up. You know, the measurement's gonna be 50 times smaller. Um, the Atari 5200, it's expecting the 500k pot uh, the 10K pot is just going to give you a 50th of the range of the regular controller. It just completely would not work. 
Uh, there's something called the capacitor trick that you can do for some potentiometers that are close. Like here is an old PC joystick. It has 100K pot. If you add an additional uh, 0.22 microfarads of capacitance to um, the PC joystick, um, then you will increase the delay on that capacitor to um, compensate for the smaller potentiometer. That works when going to a 100K pot. Um, I tried it going down to a 10K pot. Technique totally did not work. I just could not get the thing calibrated to work properly. I think it's just too far out of spec to use a 10K pot as is. Uh, so what we need is a way to scale out um, this 10K pot to something bigger. Um, we don't have to get all the way to 500K. We could get to 100K and then we could use our capacitor trick like we did with the PC joystick. Um, so how are we going to do that? Well one way to do that is to do it in the digital domain. Um, and to do that um, we would use a microcontroller to convert um, the position on this potentiometer from analog to digital. So we'll turn um, X position into a number from 0 to 255 and then we will use a digital potentiometer to turn that digital signal back into a resistance. Um, so this digital potentiometer is a 100k digital pot. So if you output a zero to this, it's going to give you zero ohms. If you output 255, it's going to give you 100 kilo ohms. Um, so we're going from analog to digital back to analog again. So 10K analog to digital and to 100K analog. Um, it's unfortunate because that's going to introduce some, you know, quantization effects into this. Um, we're going to have a granularity of 8 bits on our analog signal. We'll see if that's noticeable or not when we actually go to play with it. So it's fairly simple here. I used a AT Tiny 85 microcontroller. Um, my reason for doing that is it's small and it has some analog inputs. There's actually 10 bits of precision on the analog inputs. Um, and then I used an MCP42100 um, SPI um, digital pot. So there's two pots in it. They're both 100K. It can communicate through the SPI bus, which um, is three lines, a chip select, a data, and a clock. Um, so it's very easy to interface that to the ATtiny85. Both of these are through hole parts. Um, this one's 8 pin, that one's 14 pin. Then over here, we've got those two um, 0.22 microfarad capacitors to take that 100K pot and make it look to the 5200 like a 500K pot. There's a little bit of junk around here around fire buttons. I put like provisions for lots of different fire buttons um, in case you want to put them in different places around the left or the right. It's a jumper block that lets you reverse the fire buttons so the top button could be button zero and the bottom button one or you could flip it and make the top one button one and the bottom button zero. Um, that's about it. So looking at the board again, um, you can see all these components, uh, the microcontroller, the digital pot, um, the two uh, 0.22 microfarad capacitors, the fire buttons, thumbstick. Okay, let's try out our controller. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is we want to load something called Pete's test cartridge. Uh, Pete's test cartridge is, has some useful diagnostics. See there's two controllers here. One of them is my Atari 5200 controller. See, so move the dot around. Um, I've kind of tried to put it about where it's centered. Of course it's hard because this thing doesn't auto center so it's hard to know exactly what center is. Um, interestingly, um, the dot isn't actually in the center of this blue window in Pete's test cartridge. I don't know if it's supposed to be. Um, there's not a whole lot of information on this, but I'm going to trim up my controller so it works pretty much um, like the Atari one. If we move straight. If we move down, we end up at about the same spot. If we move right, we end up at about the same spot. Either one of them, if we move left or up, it goes off screen. Um, the other thing, you can put Pete's test cartridge into this text mode and you can look at the numbers they're returning. So, um, you know, they're, they're ballpark numbers on one another. If I go full right, um, 
around 200 on each one. Now, these things don't seem to be completely uh, repeatable. Um, you know, sometimes I'll go full right and it'll be something different. You know, there's full right and it's around 200. It was 205 a minute ago. Um, full left. Um, full left, I can get a 9. Sometimes I get a 10. Sometimes I get a 7. So, you know, my controller is a bit more repeatable, apparently, than the Atari one. Um, it would help. It would help if I knew what the numbers were supposed to be. Uh, then I could get it trimmed in properly. But uh, let's do Pac-Man. Uh, start. So yeah, we can move Pac-Man left and right, up and down. Pac-Man is working just like he should be. Um, Galaxian is an interesting game because it does use the analog capability of the joystick. It's got two different speeds uh, that you can move left and right, kind of a slow speed and a fast speed. So if we start it, so there's slow speed and fast speed. Oops, so it's, it's not really returning to center proper. There we go. Some of these games you have to like run them full left and full right in order for them to calibrate. So it's calibrated now. So yeah, there's us. Oops. There's slow speed and fast speed. Slow speed and fast speed. So that's it's all working. Fire button's working. You know, it does crisply stop when you want it to stop. So you Galaxian's doing what it should. Let's try Missile Command. Now, Missile Command is a full analog game. Um, so let's just start it. So there's our cursor. Um, we'll find that Missile Command is really a pain to play with... Um, a self-centering joystick. So this is one game where the um, Atari 5200's failure to self-center was actually a benefit because you're constantly fighting this stress to move the cursor back to the the center of the of the screen. But anyway, you can see we've got full range on our cursor. It goes everywhere it's supposed to. get up to the upper left, I can get to the lower right. Let's blow up these incoming missiles. Oops, we missed one. Um, but yeah, so the controller seems to work. Um, I'm happy with it. Thank you for watching my video. Please visit my website at www.smbaker.com for more electronics projects and sand rail stuff. Bye.